What are your questions about that? What, are, what, what, what pulls you in one direction or another direction? And then also think about kind of what expectations you came with this evening. And so I want to invite you to sort of sit with, sit with those questions for just a few minutes while we get ready to start. Did everybody do a little thinking? Well, thank you to the Spiritual Education for Adults Committee for inviting me to give um, another kickoff of the year lecture. Um, they keep inviting me to do this, and I keep agreeing. And I guess if when they when they stop inviting me, I'll be worried. Um, and so, as I think about this, I think about that the politics. As I think about sort of a kickoff of the year, that this is a year that is our, our whole environment is steeped in, in politics. And so I thought I might give a, a lecture about how that kind of uh, um, impacts our, our spiritual and religious life, but also kind of an educational lecture that might, might help us in thinking about this question of, of religion and politics. And I'd like to begin this lecture by naming a paradox which is that religious liberals tend to support the separation of church and state. We tend to be against, we tend to regard as dangerous and as perilous the intermingling of religion and government. And we tend to be suspicious of politics and religion mixing. But at the same time, virtually all of our greatest religious heroes mixed politics and religion. Martin Luther King Jr. was political religiously. The movement he led challenged the laws of cities, counties, states, and country. The movement was about bringing about political change. Gandhi was political religiously, as the movement he led attempted to free India from British rule. Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was political religiously, as he worked to end apartheid and construct a new multiracial government in South Africa. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the other leaders of the Confessing Church were political religiously as they conspired to resist and even to overthrow Hitler's Third Reich government in Germany. William Barber and the Moral Monday movement, and this is an advertisement to come on Sunday because you're going to hear some more about this on Sunday. But William Barber in the Moral Monday movement is political religiously. He seems to give more sermons in the rotunda of the legislative building and on the lawn of the state house and at the stage of the Democratic National Convention than in church. He is political religiously. And Moses... Moses is plucked in his basket from the Nile River by one of Pharaoh's attendants, is raised in Pharaoh's royal court, and speaks the message of God to Pharaoh himself. Let my people go is a religious and political statement. And Jesus, Jesus too, is political religiously. Don't forget that he is arrested by centurions, charged with sedition, and executed by Pontius Pilate. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean for religious liberals to, on one hand, promote the separation of church and state, while on the other hand, holding in highest esteem, in highest esteem, those religious luminaries who were political religiously? So what I want to do this evening is begin with a little history. I want to go back to the, the early days of our country, to the Founding Fathers, and even to before that, and touch briefly on their concept of religious freedom. But then I'd like to jump ahead, jump ahead to the present day, and explore the various options that we have today for being political, and explore some of the factors that are likely to affect how our present day views are shaped. So quick history, and then quite a bit more about the present day. Before the American Revolution, America had an established religion, or rather it had multiple established religions. In Puritan Massachusetts, our ancestors, the Puritan Congregationalists, had a state church, state church supported by tax dollars. Ministers were state employees. In fact, while en route to Boston Harbor in 1630, John Winthrop, who would become governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, preached a sermon 
to the passengers on the ship about what kind of community they would create together. The sermon was entitled, A Model of Christian Charity. And the part that's most remembered from that sermon is the famous line about America being a city on a hill, which was the first articulation of American exceptionalism before they even got to America. Less remembered today, unfortunately, is Winthrop's call for communalism, for Christian charity, the idea that what makes us a city on a hill is that we take care of each other. But anyways, Governor Winthrop preached a sermon at the founding of colonial Massachusetts. And through the 1600s, Election Day was actually treated as a religious day that began with a mandatory church service in order to hear the minister deliver an election sermon. And in fact, if you go into the archives at at Harvard Divinity School, you, you can find copies of those election sermons that were given. So that was the intermingling of the early days. The different colonies were different religiously. New York was Presbyterian, Pennsylvania was Quaker, Maryland was largely Catholic, and Virginia on down was Anglican, was Church of England. Taxes here paid in North Carolina built the Anglican churches and paid Anglican priests. That was how they made their living. By the time the revolutionary period came around and the United States began to form its own government, The question was raised about religious diversity, and some religious minorities wondered whether their liberties would be protected in this new country. And it's interesting to note that with the formation of the United States, there was no religious majority at the national level. Each and every denomination was a minority. And so everybody had kind of a little stake in this question. In 1790, when President George Washington visited Rhode Island, he engaged in conversation with members of the Toro Synagogue in Newport, one of the oldest Jewish communities in the United States. It's no accident that Rhode Island would have one of the oldest synagogues in the United States. Rhode Island was founded as a haven for religious freedom and willingly accepted Quakers, Baptists, and others who were banished for religious reasons from neighboring Massachusetts, in fact, before um, for the time, you could be banished for being of a different religion and sent to another state. So that August, August of 1790, the Toro Synagogue received a follow-up letter from George Washington, a letter that congregation still takes out and reads each August, has done for um, two and a quarter centuries. And so let me read a portion of George Washington's letter to the synagogue. It is now no more the toleration of it's it's no more that that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So Washington's letter is fascinating in that it promises that it will give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance when it comes to religion. But it's even more interesting in that it invites, even demands, all religious people to be involved in government in a supportive and effectual way. And I think what Washington is getting at here is what we would later call American civil religion. If you're interested in this exchange with the Jewish community in Rhode Island, it's mentioned, uh, it was mentioned in a lovely op-ed by Sarah Vowell uh, that appeared in the New York Times in August. That uh, if, you're a, if you're a Sarah Vowell fan, as I am, you can read it there. But then there's another letter that I want to mention. This letter was also from a sitting president to a religious minority group in the Northeast, This was Thomas Jefferson's letter in 1802 to the Danbury Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut. This is the letter in which the phrase wall of separation between church and state was first used. And many of you probably don't know this, but but I wrote my undergraduate thesis on conceptions of religious freedom in America in the period following the Revolutionary Era with a special emphasis on Jefferson. And so, so I read a stack of books about this high about about that. Um, 
and, and have used it in zero sermons through the years. But in this lecture, you get a little bit of it. So what's interesting is that the Danbury Baptists had written to Jefferson seeking support and relief from him because they believed that the laws of Connecticut violated their religious freedom. And Jefferson wrote back to them, taking their side, taking the Baptist side, and expressing his commitment that the government show no partiality in matters religious. Jefferson was of the belief that in matters religious, that if there could be true religious freedom, then a rational and uncorrupted and correct form of religion would blossom naturally. For Jefferson, religious freedom was a prerequisite for the flourishing of good religion. And so Washington and Jefferson each approached the relationship between government and religion differently, even though both were proponents of religious freedom. Washington believed in religious freedom out of a commitment that such equal footing was, would create the conditions that would bring about harmony among different people, which he was interested in. And Jefferson believed religious freedom protected and even privileged his own religious beliefs. So now I'd like to jump ahead about 200 years to the present day. And I think today we live amidst some confusion, some uncertainty, perhaps even some ambivalence about where congregations, where churches and synagogues and and mosques and temples today ought to draw the line between religion and politics. This This is a fraught question in our nation right now. And this line is often defined by conscientiousness about trying to follow the rules set out by the Internal Revenue Service about what churches can and cannot do as tax-exempt organizations. Generally speaking, the IRS sets several rules that religious organizations are supposed to follow. And uh, many of these rules are, um, first, that a representative of the church speaking through church communication channels or on behalf of the church cannot directly endorse a candidate. I can't tell you to vote for Clinton on the pulpit on Sunday morning or in a newsletter column or in an all-church email. Similarly, we're not allowed to endorse a political party. I can't tell you, vote Democrat. There's also a rule of fairness, which is that churches are encouraged to host political forums as long as they fairly invite all all, uh, candidates to participate and treat them equally when they're there. Um, Churches can also invite candidates to speak during an election season as long as they do not speak as candidates. And so when you saw, um, was it it yesterday or the day before in the African-American church, that interaction in Flint, Michigan, between Trump and, and the minister who goes up and says, you know, stop talking about Clinton, that was actually, a, a subtext of that was actually that we invited you to appear, but not as a candidate. There's a distinction there. There's other stuff going on, but that's, a, that's one of the distinctions. And finally, churches are permitted to take positions on ballot measures and even spend money promoting ballot measures, though they are barred from spending what the IRS terms a significant percentage of their budget on a ballot measure and they don't define significant percentage. So in other words, back in 2012, our church would have been every bit within its rights to take out an advertisement in the paper that says, the Community Church of Chapel Hill urges you to vote no on Amendment 1. We would have, that, we would have been allowed to do that. That would have, been a constant, uh, that would have had no, no difficulty with the IRS, although we probably couldn't buy $100,000 in television advertising against Amendment 1. But here's the thing that's important to note. While those are the rules, those rules were adopted by the IRS in 1954, and from 1954 to 2016, 62 years, how many congregations in the United States have had any sort of action taken against them by the IRS for political engagement? Anybody want to take a guess? Zero. The answer is actually one. It was in 1992 when an evangelical Christian church in New York took out full-page ads, full-page ads in both the Washington Post and USA Today, 
which declared that Christians must not vote for Bill Clinton. The IRS investigated and rescinded that congregation's tax-exempt letter. But, and who knows what happens if, if the IRS rescinds a tax-exempt letter of a church? What? Actually, they do not, because the IRS doesn't require churches to have tax-exempt letters to be (laughs) tax-exempt. Churches are automatically tax-exempt. So the church in New York that did that faced no consequence whatsoever. No consequence whatsoever. What's more, for the last decade, a network of hundreds of Christian pastors have participated in a campaign. They call it um, a Pulpit Freedom Sunday, a campaign to try to bait the IRS into coming after them. Most recently, on a single Sunday in October 2014, some 1,800 Christian churches made candidate endorsements from the pulpit on Sunday morning. These pastors videotaped themselves doing so and mailed the recordings of their endorsements to the IRS. And this has been going on for a decade. So the IRS has, if they've saved it, a box with 10,000 recordings from evangelical pastors endorsing candidates. And the reason the churches are doing this is that they're trying to bait the IRS into taking action because this would allow these Christian groups to file a lawsuit that would almost certainly result in a Supreme Court case with the likely outcome, with the likely outcome that the IRS regulations against political speech in churches would be struck down by the court. The thought was that the Supreme Court that gave us Citizens United would almost certainly rule in favor of Churches United. Well, now that Scalia has died and there's a Supreme Court vacancy, it's a bit more uncertain about how the Supreme Court would rule. But we're never going to find out We're never going to find out because this issue will never go to court. The IRS has been receiving recordings of pastors making endorsements for at least a decade and has utterly refused to take any action whatsoever against any religious community for political participation. The truth is that neither Republicans, when they're in charge, or Democrats, when they're in charge, want to risk the political fallout that would come from going after churches the regulations remain unenforced and will be. And so you may wonder, why are these unenforced restrictions on political speech by religious organizations, why are they there in the first place? Why did the IRS make this rule in 1954? So the answer may surprise you. The restrictions date to 1954, and it's most likely that they were enacted as part of the anti-communist Red Scare that dominated American politics in that period of the Cold War. The restrictions were actually motivated by anti-Catholicism as much as by anti-communism. There was a widespread belief that it was impossible for Catholics to pledge allegiance to our country because Catholics honor the Pope as their religious leader, and so Catholics can never truly be loyal Americans. They'll always be somewhat foreign. And there was fear that the communists would infiltrate the Catholic Church and would use the Catholic Church to bring about a communist takeover of the world. As part of this, there was a belief that Catholics in the United States were under mind control of Rome and that they were were obedient and would do whatever their priests told them to do. And so the IRS regulation against political endorsement in 1954 was a tool that the government created in order to strike back if the Catholics tried to take over an election by getting all Catholics to vote the same way. That belief in mindless Catholics is, of course, a bigoted stereotype. And these bigoted stereotypes continue to persist, although nowadays not as much against Catholics as against African Americans, who it's believed by the racist right are a gullible people who are easy to control. As William Barber recently said, you've got a heart problem when people can stand up and suggest we're gullible and don't know how to vote. Black people have to be the most sophisticated voters in America, and black women, sure enough, have had to be the most sophisticated voters, and black women voted a higher rate than any other ethnic group. 
And I know you don't think you're going to get a hearing in the black community by calling black women dumb. That was his response to that racist, bigoted assertion. Well, those people, they all just do what they're told. They're gullible. You can get them all to vote a certain way. And I want to say that, that with many things, with many things, there's this assumption that we ourselves, we ourselves here in this church, we're smart, we're independent, we're free thinkers. But other people are mindless sheep, subject to mental slavery. We can't let the Catholic priests endorse a candidate because all the Catholics will do what they say. Black pastors have really tricked their members into all voting the same way, or as we might say, we can't let the evangelicals make endorsements in their church because then evangelicals will all vote the same way. But the funny thing is, the funny thing is, if I made a political endorsement, how many of you would do what I say because I said to do it? During the primary, if I had told you, you must vote for Clinton, how many of you would have gone out and voted for Clinton? Or if I said, you need to vote for Sanders, how many of you, how many of you would actually have changed your vote because I told you to vote differently? I've yet to see anybody in church raise their hand. Oh, Gary, Gary is... Uh, <laughs> Gary's just trying to be different. He's just trying to show he's, not a, he's, not, he's an independent thinker, unlike the rest. And we worry about evangelical pastors making endorsements. They've been making them. 1,800 of them sent videos to the IRS in 2014. And so one of the things that's been truly interesting is that within the past month, numerous UU ministers have made political endorsements from the pulpit. Those have included um, Mark Stringer, who said the following last month. He said, I cannot be balanced right now. This season feels different to me from any other time in my ministry with you. In short, I simply cannot be silent about the danger posed to this country by the candidacy of Donald Trump. I cannot be silent about the possibility that this con man, this bigoted, narcissistic, fact-free, wannabe fascist, reckless, feckless blowhard could be our president. <laughs> Sunday morning. And here is what my colleague Victoria Weinstein posted on Facebook about what she said from the pulpit that same Sunday. She said... In 20 years of ministry, I've never denounced a politician by name in specific terms. I have criticized policy decisions. I've spoken out against war. I've engaged in local elections but never taken sides, just analyzed the theological values in various positions. Separation of church and state does not mean that clergy may not speak about politicians. We cannot endorse candidates, although many churches do. I've always urged participation in the democratic process, but this morning, I said this in my sermon. Quote, we must address moral failures that affect our shared lives and the elevation of Donald Trump's status to a major party candidate for the highest office in the most powerful nation in the world is a monumental moral failure. Let me say clearly, Donald Trump's entire campaign is anathema to Unitarian Universalist values and cannot be reconciled. He represents instincts and ideas that are completely contrary to and a threat to our values of interdependence, peace, democracy, intellectual inquiry, and respect for the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We used to worry a lot more in our congregations that we might offend someone if we came on too strong, condemning a position or a leader. Now I think we understand that we risk much more when we do not speak out in, our, in very clear terms about what is completely unacceptable. And then there was this from the most recent edition of the UU World magazine by UU minister Tom Shade who writes in the UU world, there is an unbridgeable gap between Unitarian Universalism as it now understands itself and the mainstream of the Republican Party. There is, is not a mere difference of political opinion. The Trump campaign is not a test of our inclusiveness. People look to their religious traditions to point to what is truly important now and in the long run. Our religious affirmations, 
the worth and dignity of each person, of every race and gender and sexual orientation and background and religion and immigration status especially, are being tested. Trumpism demands a new clarity from us. The only way forward for you use is to dissect and dismantle systems of oppression that have warped, warped our country since the beginning. And the future we need is faith that a liberated people can create a different future. Unitarian Universalism and the Republican Party are completely, to use his words, are completely, there's an unbridgeable gap between them. And so the question, the question that I began with, what is the proper relationship between politics and religion? may not be the right question to ask. The right question to ask may be, when is the right time for religious groups to engage in political behavior? Martin Luther King answered that question, that the time is right when justice is denied. Gandhi answered that question, that the time is right when liberation is needed. Desmond Tutu answered that question, the time is right when it's time to rebuild the nation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer answered that question. It's time, it's time when staying silent would be a betrayal of your faith. William Barber answers that question. It is time when the political order does not heed the call to moral justice. And I would agree. I would agree. We ought to be political when the times call for it. That's my lecture.